You know, I have a unique topic today. I, 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 I have to say, I, I probably, I, I really like, I like to challenge myself every once in a while. Um, and uh, when we talk about particularly this topic around when the going gets tough and the tough get going a call to action, one of the things that I have to consider is the words of Amanda Seal. Uh, she is an uh, she is an activist, an actress, poet, uh, media personality. I mean, she's something. Uh, if you've never seen her before or seen her work, trust me, she is quite known for something up to date recently that she said, which I think I'll start with first. I am who I am. People who know, people know who I am. And that is a beautiful thing. The people that, that I am, the people that know me, know who I am and know that it's beautiful because they don't have to guess. People like me are a blessing, she says. You don't ever have to guess. Yes, you have to do the neck with it because it's all attitude when she's saying it. <laughs> so as much of this life, so much of this life is people not willing to deal with the real and just hiding in the shadows. Instead of regarding, respecting people who are straight ahead, direct, we treat them like they're a nuisance, like they're a disruption, but really they are a gift. It removes the guesswork to be who I am. The subtext, the guesswork of alter, ulterior motives. I am what I am. What you see is what you get. Whatever you hear me saying is what I am saying. And to me, that is a lot easier of a route. I found people in my life over time that I see, and guess what they say? It's dope to live that way. People who see that see me as a gift, not an attack. Her words resonated with me for quite some time as I began to think about this piece. And you would probably be like, well, how does that relate to Darwin? <laughs> I am who I am, right? Um, She's, you know, she, she does something very unique because she offers us a framing about who she is and in some way, a way for us to look at ourselves to, to get real. And what does that reality mean if we do not go through some kind of evolution? I'm gonna be real with you today. I am not a fan of Darwin Day. <laughs> For me to even talk about Darwin right now was like, I gotta tell on myself, right? I have to tell on myself. I'm gonna step away from this mic, so I'm gonna, get, I'm, I'm gonna be hot. Uh, I can't do Darwin Day. I struggle. And I'll tell you why. Growing up in a home, literally, where you were brought up in a black neighborhood, you know, with black family, and, they're talk and the first thing you hear somebody talk about with evolution is you're related to a monkey. <laughs> now we all know that's not Darwin's cause, I wanna be honest. We know it, we know it, we know it, I, I, and I did my homework. But don't get me wrong, in American culture, with American supremacy, and the way that we're looking at things, it's tight, yeah. right? So bear with me, because it's, like, it's not like I'm going to dive into Darwin like some amazing intellectual, let me talk about science and evolution today, right? That's not going to happen. What will happen <laughs> is, is the ability for us to understand a few things that I think is important regarding a really great book called uh, Darwin's Sacred Cause. But let's start first with the natural selection. That's what I want to start with. Jacob, just a little slide. There we go, a little, little, you know, little Charles Darwin brought the idea of natural selection into attention for, with the world's bestseller on the origin of species, right? 
Most of y'all probably already know that. I can guarantee you, you do. And as a result, that work was then morphed, shifted, depending on the social context and who it involved. This great gift of evolution and the idea that we were all interconnected to all living things showed in some kind of way later a superiority in much of our societies. But let's be honest, Darwin, in some aspects, particularly in the text that is written about him by Adrian Desmount and James Moore, that Darwin was, was an abolitionist. And it was deeply rooted because of his mother's family. This constantly was also, his abolition work was also reinforced when he did his voyage on the, on the Beagle, which we have lovely outside. <laughs> and as well as, by, as well as by the events in America, the rise of scientific racism began to take hold, especially in the dark halls of, um, of Harvard during the Civil War. It's important for us to note, though, Darwin's time, he argued that blacks and whites had originated as separate species. With whites created, with whites created a superiority, though. Darwin considered this to be an arrogant position. He believed that far from being separate species, races belonged to the same human family. He pushed even further with this, kind of contradictory for a moment, saying that slavery was therefore a sin and it also needed to be abolished. He's got to wrestle with his scientific evidence here. His theory of evolution gave all the race, races of blacks and whites, animals, plant life, on a playing field of evolution. In his case, evolution meant emancipation. If we could all see ourselves interconnected, we could have evolution together. This gets a little challenging when you read this text about a sacred cause, Desmount and Moore go and push on the idea with their own thesis, talking about racial extermination as they began to examine how Darwin is embracing racism and dealing with it. They write the following. By biologizing colonial eradication, Darwin was making racial extinction an inevitable evolutional uh, consequence. Race and, spe and other species perished was a norm of prehistory. The uncivilized races were following suit except that Darwin's me mechanisms were here also created a modern masquerade. Imperialist expansions was becoming the very motor of human progress. I'll read that again. Imperialistic expansions were becoming the very motor of human progress. It is interesting given the family's emotional anti-slavery views, but Darwin's biologizing of genocide should appear to be dispassionate. Natural selection was now something about people who are weak. And people who are weak would eventually be distinct, uh, would be extinguished. Individuals, race, even had to perish according to his research. 
This is what we have to consider. That as Darwin is doing this work, we cannot dismiss that Europeans were the agents of evolution because of modern progress. So when we look at, if we can go to natural selection, when we look at natural selection uh, here, got this wonderful little graph. It starts with a real primary point and then it breaks into three. And this is just a small example, right? I'm quite sure many of you know how this works, but right, it explains how organisms uh, are able to better adapt to their environment or more likely to survive, reproduce, passing on their genes to the next generation. This process causes species to change and diverge over time. So what does it look like for us to change and adapt over time? What comes up for us? Well, we have to consider how we change. What does change look like? It's 2024. Some of us have been in probably Minnesota all of our lives. Some of us have grown and developed and adapted to shift, shifts in politics, in our family makeups. And after a while, the very probably primary source of our being and existence, we have learned to detach ourselves from and change. We are not, and I can say I am not, like my ancestors. I am my ancestors' wildest dreams, and I can guarantee you I would freak them out if they were here. <laughs> They'd be like, what you got on? What is, what is the deal, right? That is, that is normal in our evolutionary state, to own who we are and to own how we will become. But I want to make us more conscious of our evolutionary process, because I do believe, if I may make this if I may shift the dialogue of Darwin, as I said in my, in my briefing, regarding our community, this place we call FUS, why can't we be the natural selection? What would that mean for us to be the natural selection? The ever-changing, the ever-evolving, the one who can actually do the variation work, the selection work, as well as the adapting and changing. And change, not only over time, but in time. In time to meet people where they are. In time for forces regarding how our democracy is being challenged. If we changed in time, we might be able to speak to those things before they even come up because we have prepared ourselves to be adaptable and flexible regarding change. We, if I may, should be the thermostat regarding how we set the tone in this wonderful area we call Minneapolis. What does that look like? How we considered that kind of charge? So I invite you to consider the next thing regarding what we can do. Everybody say Vista. 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 Okay, Vista print, yep, exactly. Uh, <laughs> So, the V is for variation, the I is for inheritance, inheritance, the S is selection, time is the next, and adaptation, vista, right? So, if we practice this, if we practice a variation and we offer people a variation of congregational experiences, conversations and programs. What does it look like and feel like for us? Who are we reaching out to? Who are we connecting with? Who are we in fellowship with? 
I'll go back to my original question. My original question is, it's 2024. Do you know where your children are? <laughs> but that's a real question for us. For some of us who have been here. It's 2024. Where are your cousins? Where are your, where are your colleagues? Where is the invitation in 2024? What does it look like and feel like for you? Oftentimes we are told that, you know, as humanists, we don't proselytize. I get it. But I have to invite you to really think about what does it mean for you to evolve with somebody alongside you in this journey? Because I'd rather be humanist together than humanist individualized. I'd rather be a community together, growing and becoming together, than actually isolating myself. I'd rather be in an argument with those that are challenging and difficult with me. Come on, I just, I, I, can I be honest with you? I do, I will challenge you in a minute. Speak. Right, because that's important. Because it offers co commun communal accountability. Because I, I don't only want to grow, I want some other folk to grow, right? Exposure is important when we deal with evolution, right? Exposure is important. And so that, I think that is something that I think we need to push on. Variations, if you do not know, are oftentimes organisms that have various sizes, colors, and they have the ability to fight off certain diseases. And they have countless traits. Let's, make it, let, let's, let's interpret that for a minute. They come in different sizes. They come in different colors. And they come with different defense mechanisms. They, this means they're not cut from the same cloth as you and how you see yourself. You get to enjoy the variation of diversity and inclusion. When we go through selection, we know that resources are limited. More organisms just so happen to be born is, what, is how it's broken down. But as they advance, they might be the very few that can survive because they learn how to hold on to their resources and find successful ways. They find and discover successful ways of succeeding. I, I bring this up because I believe that our congregational community has the ability to succeed. I believe we actually have what it takes to actually offer something so unique, not only by the very nature of being a humanist congregation, but by the very nature of how we are made up in this space. That if we brought our wealth of wisdom, our knowledge, our diverse thinking, and all of its complexities, we have something to hold on to together. Time and adaptation are vital. Generation after generation after generation, each trait is advancing. If you have had anyone grow up in this society and community, it's the reason why I can ask the question, it's 2024. Do you know where your children are? If they're not here, don't freak out. <laughs> they took the humanism that was granted to them and made a variation of it. They decided in some way to make meaning 
out of the time that they were here and fostered it into something else. They are adapting and changing with the times. And I'm not saying that we're, excuse me, you know, for right now, pew warmers. <laughs> They'll be changing soon. <laughs> but that's the part of adaptation. That's the part of change, right? Actively trying to understand the world outside of these walls is where we find some of those who have, we foster relationships with and they've moved beyond. It's hard to think that way. When we have held on to brick and mortar, it is hard to think that way when we are living in a time where honestly, we need to figure out how to work together. And it's hard to be that way when working together seems to be still the segregated hour of a Sunday. So what is next? We are getting ready to go through the biggest discernment process uh, regarding what FUS is. And what does that feel like? It's got a little anxiety to it. It's got a little uncertainty to it. And we hope that someone can lead the charge to hold us together in our belonging, but not only that, in our becoming, as you've heard me say so often. So I'm inviting you, First Unitarian Society, to, to, to soften. The best way for things to change, the best thing for us to do is soften. A great text by Sanford uh, Quinter talks about soft systems. Soft systems. One might say it is driven by its softness. When something is soft, Jacob, you can show that slide of the softness, um, soften. Um, it's, it has a capacity to move, to differentiate internally to absorb, transform, and exchange information with the surrounding, to develop complex interdependent subs and super systems. I love that complex definition. Just sitting with that is a meditation in itself. That when I soften, when I soften what I think I've always known, when I, when I soften myself to engage Darwin again and put a new lens on, when I soften myself about the rigidness of humanism and our place as the first Unitarian society within the dialogue of humanism, how do we soften ourselves to offer differentiation, to transform? to exchange information. I had the wonderful opportunity over this week to go to Las Vegas. I promise you I didn't gamble. <laughs> um, I didn't get anything in return anyway. So, uh, but during that, believe it or not, I actually went to a progressive Pentecostal conference. In that conference, uh, it is established by a bishop by the name of Bishop Yvette Flunder. Her partner, named Sherry, is, um, they decided to establish a new movement for, for affirming queer, LGBTQIA folk in ministry. Pentecost and affirming <coughs> ministry. That's dangerous. And I want to be anywhere where good danger is. Because I was like, ooh, yes. yes. So of course, when I walked through the door, they know me a bit. Some of them, they said, but they still doing their, you know. I'm like, OK, cool. Reach over and turn to your neighbor. I want you to pray with your neighbor. I was like, don't, don't ain't nobody touching me. <laughs> Nah, 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 nah. If you walk over here, you ain't gonna get no prayer. I'll smile at you. You know, 
It's not because I'm being, you know, I'm not trying to change, but it's at the same time, I know what holds me in shared connection. But I loved being there and I, I enjoyed watching what I saw. And my presence so happened to inspire another conversation about why don't we have more humanists in our space? The Pentecostals want to know why aren't humanists in the space? Well, they asked me, I said, well, you know, I've never really had a problem because culturally I was Pentecost, y'all know this. And I never really felt any type of way. The two things that people in Pentecost and humanism are interested in is that they look for evidence. Now, Pentecostal folk are looking for the evidence in speaking in tongues. But we, we love our scientific evidence. And if you understand that, that's like speaking in tongues. <laughs> okay. <laughs> right? It does something to us to, to have that, to share in that. But I softened my system. I softened my system so I could engage. I softened my system so I, could so I could share in community. I softened my system so I could actually have relationship. I softened my system so I could be in fellowship to also stand for justice. And everything we talked about in that conference had everything to do with reproductive rights. They were so proud in Minnesota. Yeah. I was like, yes, yeah. so I was like, y'all better talk about us. <laughs> uh, right? The other thing was is that we were talking about Immigration, what, we have, what, what they also have called transmigration. This has been a refuge for trans folk, right? We should be proud of that, but also our community has every right to feel like we're on the front lines of it too. Because that's our dialogue, that's our home. So we have even something to offer in our variation. Even if it is not, that's why I, I want to encourage folk to constantly keep thinking about their relationship with, with interreligious dialogue. You deserve to be there. Get like Shirley Chisholm. If you don't see a, if you don't see a seat, get a folding chair. <laughs> Pull it up. Get a folding chair. Because you belong there. Your dialogue is important. And I realized that over, over the week, that my dialogue was important. And the things I had to say. Next slide. I could spend a lot of time talking about soft systems and as we think about soft systems, one of the things that y'all know I love, I love looking at organizations and I love to look at us. Um, and if you've never read this book, uh, Humanocracy is an amazing book. I do recommend it when you are trying to work with people. Uh, I don't, it, it doesn't even have to be an organization. It can be just working with people. Um, and I just want to point out the difference between bureaucracy and what is now being seen as human, uh, humanocracy, right? That bureaucracy engages the institution first, the vision of the institution, then individuals to make the institution flow, and then it has an output. And that's often how we have kind of run within our spaces. I've seen it a lot, especially, um, particularly around, um, humanist communities in general. We start off with people. We start off real strong as like community organized. But then we shift and we turn into an organization and then we start getting into the, 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 the real politics and the bureaucracy of it all. And it gets a little murky. And then people get hurt because they're in a system. And it's not people driven. <coughs> Humanocracy puts the people first and offers a deep listening practice where we don't only hear what people have to say about what they hope, what they hope, and, and hope to do or what they're inspired to do. We actually get a chance to hear them talk about the value of why they have stayed. And I was thinking to myself, wow, 
the conversation keeps coming to my mind. It's 2024. Where are our children? This is not an educational claim, and I get it. But I am offering us this as a way that we interconnect with each other. I use the word children also just as a disclaimer. Someone who comes out of a house and trans ball community, we are all children. We are all children. And so when I'm asking that question, I am asking you to think about your neighbor beside you. Because if you don't see them, I hope that you would be concerned. What I believe deeply, what I believe deeply is that if we're going to consider looking at our humanist movement, I want it to be a movement, not a congregation. Can I just talk to you personally for a second? I see us as a movement, not as just a congregation. I see us putting charge in the atmosphere not just putting out a call. I don't need you to pick up the phone on the other end. I need you to actually do something. I need you to put something at your expense. That's what we charge, right? So when we soften ourselves and begin to engage, we will begin to engage in a process that will sometimes feel mysterious. Sanford uh, Quinter, says that it's an epigenetic within an organization, that it, it, it comes from a mysterious process and then it gradually forms and it also has to be right within the environment. That if we need something that's epigenetic, it's going to be mysterious. It's going to be unheard of. It's gonna be almost unthought of but it's gonna require for us to push ourselves in conversation to bridge. I'm inviting you to challenge yourself with that. Our culture is, has to move. We cannot stay with classic systems. Every day, most of the time, I can't say every day, correction, Often, you and I are having conversations about different styles of music. Very different from the beaten path that we have always done. Because I love various styles. It is because I am interested in new mechanics that create relationship. It is not because of the simple fact that FUS is in need of change. I know that we are transformation. This is when we become more sensible and have more sensitivity around such issues, around social justice, membership growth. If nothing more, even the very dynamics of serving other communities as we spoke of last time with Dara, going to Plymouth Church and feeding people. We have to soften our systems. We cannot be rigid, for it will cause many to miss out. My last slide. It's 2024. Do you know where your children are? I have to ask this question because when we think about it, David often talked about people before ideas. And one of the things that I was very interested in and just helping us think about is when we decide to set a goal this year, stepping into 2024, fiscal year, to 2025, I hope we think about what are our goals and how, they are in, and how much impact they have. Are they gutsy? How gutsy are they? Right? When we are risk taking, are we, are we shunning the risk? Right? Are we looking really closely at the budget and say, I can't do that? 
you know? How fast are we willing to go? How creative are we? What is our autonomy? Our autonomy, meaning that it holds our integrity of who we are within the UUA, within the fellowship of who we are as humanists in the UUA. What is our commitment like? And what would inspire you to be more committed? And lastly, nonconformity. What an incredible place to be in where we do not have to conform. Where we do not have to look like everybody else. We don't have to do it the same way as everybody else either. We have the ability to be our most creative self and engage it all. I want to encourage you to engage it all. I want to encourage you to engage it all because you're worth it. Because it's tough. And when it's tough, you got to get going. So I'm inviting you to get going. I'm inviting you to get going because it will be the very moment that will allow for you to realize how you are flourishing, how you are evolving, how you are adapting, how you are changing with time, creating space for others in time, how you are engaging in selections and providing resources, making sure that we all succeed some ways you are offering an inherent worth to others. And so I want to invite you to do that. Let me go back to my homegirl for a second. Amanda Seals said it best. I am who I am. People know that. And that is a beautiful thing. The person that I am is beautiful because you never have to guess. You never have to guess. I invite you to be in the space where we never have to guess about each other, but we can grow together. Thank you. Oh.